elements that we are going to talk about. Then from there, we we'll need to know how we are going to investigate, then manage, and then we'll look at the complications. Okay, with that being said, we will have to go into the, the lecture. Okay, so by definition, we are saying cerebral palsy is a disorder of posture and movement due to a non-progressive lesion in the motor pathways of the developing brain. Okay, what this simply means is that there are two things that are really happening here. Okay, there is a lesion and then we are looking at the development of this condition itself. Okay, so we are saying there is a lesion. This lesion is non-progressive or we, in other words would say the lesion is permanent. Okay, and this lesion is in the motor pathway. Okay, so basically the the parts of the brain that are going to be affecting uh, the motor function of the human body. Okay, so the motor pathways of the developing brain is where these lesions are. Okay, further here we are saying the underlying cerebral pathology is permanent and unprogressive. Okay, cerebral palsy is due to brain malformation or damage affecting those areas in the motor function so this is basically talking about what i have explained so the lesion is permanent but um the the, the condition itself is non-progressive okay so as this child grows cerebral palsy does not worsen this is what this means okay the lesion is permanent therefore the condition is non progressive all right <clears throat> so now we are saying uh, cerebral palsy has got various causes okay however in the developing child the resulting clinical picture is not static it can be caused at any time during pregnancy during delivery or up to five years of age okay it interferes with the normal development because it arises early in life. It is often associated with other neurologic problems and uh, mental problems. We'll look at these into more detail as we progress. All right. So the causes can be either antenatal. Under antenatal here we've got cerebral dysgenesis, which basically means there's a malfunction in brain development. Okay, cerebral malformation. The brain is developing, but it is not developing as it is supposed to. There is congenital infection, congenital cysts, failure of migration, of the gray matter, and hypoxia or ischemia. Okay, that is under antenatal causes. Intrapartum uh, causes. Okay, here we've got hypoxic ischemic encephalopathy as well as birth trauma, various birth traumas. Postnatal causes, here we've got cerebral ischemia, intraventricular hemorrhage, which is abbreviated as IVH hydrocephalus, trauma, non-accidental injuries, hyperbilirubinemia, meningitis, and so on and so forth. So we can see that cerebral palsy is not a condition that just occurs due to a single cause but it has various causes at different ages in life okay so now let's look at the classification of cerebral palsy here we are talking about uh, the types okay in other words would say the types the first classification we're going to be looking at is spastic cerebral palsy spastic cerebral palsy starts with hypotonia progressing to spasticity and it is the most common type. Hypotonia simply means there is a reduced tone in the muscles of this particular patient and spasticity in other words we would say spasticity is stiffness of the muscles. Okay, Spastic cerebral palsy is usually due to um, an upper motor neuron lesion. That is just one important uh, point to note when we are looking at spastic cerebral palsy. Now, there are basically three types of spastic cerebral palsy, okay, depending on how this patient is going to be presenting. The first type is the one we are calling as the hemiplegic or hemiplegia. Hemiplegia basically means there is paralysis on one side of the body, okay? So, one arm, if it's the left, 
the left arm and the left leg are both paralyzed so there is unilateral involvement and in this hemiplegia it is also important to note that the arm is more affected as compared to the leg the other type we'll be looking at is diplegia okay diplegia here it's either the, the arms or the legs where the paralysis is but this one is more common in the arms in the legs sorry compared to the arms and then we have the third type which is going to be affecting all the four limbs which is the one we are calling quadriplegia so now despite having different types of uh, spastic cerebral palsy we are still going to look at the general clinical features that we have and uh, uh, spastic cerebral palsy. So here we have hypertonia, abnormal brisk tendon jerks, ankle clonus, and extensor plantar responses. Okay, so that is uh, on spastic cerebral palsy. The second classification we'll be looking at is dystonic or athetoid cerebral palsy. Uh, dystonic or athetoid cerebral palsy is characterized by irregular and invol involuntary movement okay and this one uh, primarily affects the basal ganglia in the brain okay so there may be uh, the the involuntary movement or the irregular movements in this particular type of cerebral palsy may be continuous or on voluntary active movement okay Athetosis is the commonest form with slow purposeless muscle movements and extensor muscle spasms. That is on dystonic or athetoid cerebral palsy. The third type we'll be looking at is ataxic cerebral palsy. And this one is associated with hypotonia, weakness, and coordinated movement, and intentional tremor, and, and intentional tremor, okay? Ataxic cerebral palsy primarily affects the cerebellum, okay? This is where the lesion is, the permanent lesion that we talked about earlier. And the fourth class that is there is the mixed cerebral palsy where all of the above types are present in the same patient. Okay, so that is about the classification of cerebral palsy. So we have four classifications, spastic, athetoid, ataxic, and mixed cerebral palsy for classifications. Now in general, cerebral palsy has got general clinical features that are going to be present in either of the four classifications that we've talked about. Okay, So when a patient comes to you, you're going to notice that this patient has got delayed milestones. Delayed milestones, these are basically on the growth and development features you find that a child is not uh, up to date with their milestones uh, in reference to their age okay the other thing is these patients usually have an ab abnormal tone in infancy they also tend to present with an abnormal gait an abnormal gait in other terms can be uh, can be defined as an abnormal uh, stance or an abnormal balance okay then feeding difficulties developmental delay in terms of language and social abilities and persistence of primitive reflexes these are some of the general clinical features that these uh, patients are going to be presenting with now cerebral palsy is usually not diagnosed until several months have passed when it becomes obvious that motor development is abnormal or delayed okay this is for one simple reason remember we are saying cerebral palsy is affecting the motor aspect of human function so now until our child is able to exhibit those motor features somewhere around six months that is where we are going to expect that this child is going to present with uh, classical features of cerebral palsy Infant may be brought for no head control at three months. That could be one of the early features of cerebral palsy, okay? Because we know that by three months we expect that this infant is able, to, is supposed to be uh, able to control their head balance. Okay. Now there are other associated features with cerebral palsy. On top of those clinical features that we've talked about, when we examine these patients from time to time, we 
you'll find that they also exhibit features of learning impairment, visual impairment, for example, strabismus. Strabismus simply means uh, this child is unable to focus with both eyes on one object. You'll find that one eye is able to focus on the object while the other is having problem and they will tend to squint. Okay? The other associated features that these patients will have may be hearing impairment, speech and language difficulties, behavioral problems, as well as epilepsy. Okay? So these are just some of the features that are going to be presented alongside the general uh, clinical features that a patient will have in cerebral palsy. Now, how do we investigate these patients? Okay? A cranial ultrasound is very important because we'll be able to identify uh, different types of uh, abnormalities or lesions that may be present. The same goes for a uh, CT scan. Okay? We may do a metabolic screen just to rule out other causes of these features that these patients will be presenting with. Hearing assessment, ophthalmolo ophthalmological assessment is also done to rule out other differentials just in case this patient has got other underlying causes. Okay? Otherwise, the diagnosis of cerebral palsy is clinical. Okay? So based on our clinical features and history, we are going to be able to diagnose cerebral palsy. The other investigations, the, the, the radiology and other labs that may be done are just for differential purposes. <clears throat> okay, now we come to the management. Okay, the first thing we need to, to note when it comes to our management is that management of cerebral palsy is supposed to be a multidisciplinary approach. Okay, S uh, specialists are involved. We are going to have occupational therapists, physiotherapists, speech therapists, social workers or teachers, developmental psychologists, pediatricians, orthopedic surgeons, neurologists, ophthalmologists, and audiologists. So these teams are supposed to come together in order to achieve the best for our patient. Okay? Cerebral palsy is not curable, but it is treatable by means of this multidisciplinary approach. Every clinician can do it a lot in cooperation with the caretaker. So the caretaker also has an important role in <coughs> helping to manage the cerebral palsy. So we need to teach how to avoid contractures, okay? So we need to help the caretakers, um, uh, help the patient to stretch and do all those exercises to avoid contractures. We also need to teach them how to stimulate motor and psychological development. On top of that, baclofen can be used if there is severe spasm. Baclofen is from a class of drugs known as uh, skeletal muscle uh, relaxants. Okay? Uh, close supervision of the nutrition status is going to help us in um, better recovery of our patient and then if our patient is convulsing we want to ensure that we treat the convulsions as they come. Okay. That is basically how we are going to manage cerebral palsy. Now, what are the complications, the virus complications? We'll be looking at the complications according to their systems, okay? So complications that may be affecting the central nervous system. Here we may have intellectual disability, epilepsy, visual impair impairment,